Hello, everyone, and welcome to the, to, well, the normal 0k exhibition match replay stream. I, your host Dominic, we have games, we have replays, we have a 3v3 by request, because people request things sometimes, and I like to, I like to do requests. So we have that, and it's going to be a match between Covert, Briley, and I, Vorax versus Kooten, Captain, Captain Dab Glass, and Pudis. Yes, Vorax. Yeah, I'm sorry, the stream probably is going to be really bad for compression on that one, because I can't even see it. So, we are on Ackland Wastelands. Really, Ackland? We haven't seen this map in a very long time. Ackland Wastelands is, in fact, a StarCraft 2 map that was... or Yeah, specifically StarCraft 2. That was ported over, because that's the thing that happens sometimes. No, well, there we go. Yeah, with that, we are going to be... Like, this is 3v3, and 3v3, of course, is very chaotic. And also very gunship heavy from the Northwest team. Double gunship plant, really? Okay, cool. That's gonna be interesting. The Southwest team going for something more normal, rover tank, cloaky. No air on their side at all, interestingly enough. But it looks like double blast wing is the idea. I'm a bit surprised Northwest team did that because economy shared. Like, you can have people assist build their teammates' stuff, and then there's a different factory involved, but I guess they just wanted to have multiple people controlling blast wings I, okay sure why not i i mean it's one of those things that i don't usually see but i mean when it happens it's well I'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes because blast wings are a very risky setup like when you use blast wings it's likely they're going to lose a lot of them without them dealing any damage though on ackland wastelands because of this entire south section we're just open sea it's actually not that hard and this is exactly what we're seeing right now. The Blast Wings coming in the side. Should be able to take out one of the metal extractors. Possibly take out some of the workers. Oh, if they could just get to those... Ah, they didn't manage to. I was say, if they just get to those conjurers, they'd be able to take them out and do a lot of damage. But unfortunately, that is not going to happen. Still, though, get rid of some radar. Damage the factory a bit. Get rid of a couple of metal extractors. Hey, good stuff. Overall, I'd say the damage has been done. But that's only one set. That was Kooten's. Pudis is on the other hand. I'm not sure where those are going to be. But looks like they didn't manage to do that much with them yet. I mean, Pudis didn't manage to do much with the Blastwings yet. So, I still... That's kind of interesting. Going for Blastwing, Nat, I... I'm surprised. Quite frankly, I would expect it to see some Locusts by now. Or Rapiers. Either way, if you're going to go for double gunship, it seems like, you know, one of them going for Blastwings, the other one going for more of the mid-game stuff makes a lot of sense to me. Do like these are the bandits on defense, though. Like, it's clear that the strategy right now is use the blast wings to disrupt everything the southeast team has, and then use use the bandits to make sure that nothing is able to get in to stop that disruption. Not a bad strategy, but at this point, the southeast team they're not really being too hampered by it. Like, yes, their metal extractors have been destroyed, but their economy growth is faster. On the other hand, there are Pudis's blast wings. I was wondering where those would be. And they're right here on the north side of the map trying to just go around the side and cause lots of problems. I mean, there's a couple of defenders, which should stop most of that. But even that, no, two defenders against half a dozen blast wings. Sorry, pickets. Well, there's half a dozen blast wings and two gnats. It's only three missiles each. The so one of those is going to survive. But on the other hand, the separation here might still be a might still pose a problem. Blast wings are able to come in, though. They should be able to, at least in a few cases, hit a couple metal extractors, slow things down a bit. Southeast team is falling behind now. The North, really, Northwest team has managed to get their expansions going, so they're about five metal per second ahead, and that should easily increase once these blast wings get in here. Wait, they're going to the factory? No, that's not gonna work. Fire does not stack. Fire damage does not stack. That is, well, that's a that's a lotus dead. But that's otherwise it. Like, so, I mean, okay, blast wings do have an explosion. But it doesn't deal a whole lot of... Oops, where's my space bar? There we go. Blast wings deal a bit of damage. 80 damage here. Most of what they do, however, is damage and the burn. Fire damage does not stack in 0k. It used to years ago, but it doesn't anymore. So blast wings can only do so much when you're actually fighting like that. Like, they'll come in, they'll deal some damage. Every, every bit of fire does deal significant amounts of damage. I mean, it's 15 DPS for a good, I think, 20 seconds or so. It's like 300 damage. But, well, okay, I'm spitballing slightly, but somewhere around there. And with that, you get a lot going on there. Like, a lot of stuff killed. Metal extractors go down usually in one. Light defenses also go down in one. 
But otherwise, nothing stacks. The damage from the Blast Wings, like their actual explosion damage is about all you get other than that. And it doesn't stack very much. Like, it stacks, but they're not going to be close enough. It's ugh. The point is, sending in a bunch of Blast Wings to one location is usually not the way to go. Still, we do see that has been able to support a Rogue Switch, Rogue Bandit setup. Not a bad choice, considering the size of the map. We are going to get a lot of Raiders, so I'm not entirely confident of the Rogues. But Outlaws would have a slightly harder time. What I am kind of confused about is why there are no Rapiers. I mean, Locusts aren't a bad idea for harassment, but Rapiers one-shot Glaives. So, the Rapiers come in here, start attacking the Glaives. Well, that's just an entire army of Glaives dead. Like, three or four Rapiers wipe out the entire force of Glaives down here. No problems. Again, Locusts, very good for dealing with bases, especially if they're undefended. But they're not undefended. There's a lot of stuff going on to defend that. This Razor being very prime in that. Very obvious choice, not to mention the Crashers. So, ultimately, Air Forces are going to have a bit of a hard time, especially things like Locusts, which have to stay in and deal damage over time. Again, another reason why I think Rapiers would be the better choice. But we aren't seeing that built at all. Pudis entirely letting letting Akutin take the resources to build their own thing. Actually, letting Captain Dingus, or Captain Dabglass. Sorry, Captain Dabglass. <laughs> Getting Captain Dabglass to get their own army up. Thug Rogue Bandit Ball. Which actually could work okay with the thugs there that does reduce the amount of damage the bandits could deal. Like the opposing, sorry, the glaives could deal coming in from the southeast side. So Briley's going to have a bit of a harder time with that. However, there's also just the fact that the southeast team isn't that far behind economically and has a much stronger ground army, as well as a reasonably strong anti-air force. Though unfortunately for them, it's not right next to where these lotuses are. But then again, scorchers can kind of deal with lotuses if they stop moving. If the scorchers stop moving, I mean. Unfortunately, they did not stop moving in time. So yeah, those locusts, not going to be too hard. Still, though, we will see what happens when the levelers get in there. Because the levelers are going to get in, and that's going to be a problem. That'll start tearing apart the locusts. But on the other hand, the locusts can't really get into the main base. Or at least can't get into past here. Actually, you know what? No. That's it. That's just this razor. If the locusts can dodge the razor and dodge the crashers, like right now, if they go around the back, they'd actually be able to deal loads of damage because the crashers are way out of position if they wanted to defend the back side of the base. That would be huge. But it looks like it's not going to be the case. Clearly, Kooten is a little bit too risk-averse on that. I don't totally blame them. They don't want to lose their Air Force. But at the same time, those are the only Crashers. Like, that's it. There's nothing else to defend the base. But hey, that's what Blast Wings can scout out. Bring them around the back and see what's what's there, what's not. At the same time, though, Captain Diveglass's Thug Ball, now it's coming online. And making sure we're all these Glaives, too. Oh, I should have pointed out, Bandits do beat Glaives for cost. Unfortunately, those fencers are not getting stopped by the shields. The bandit's going too far in front of the thugs. The thugs cannot help them. I mean, they're still around. It's still going to be fine. They can get rid of the glaives and the fencers. But unfortunately, those bandits are not around. So this entire force of glaives coming around the back, that should force a retreat. Actually, if Captain Dagloss doesn't retreat, they're going to lose their entire force to these glaives that are coming in right now. In large part because those bandits did not get into the thug shields. I mean, you kind of have to put them on guard, like a circle guard, very close to the thug. To make sure that they don't get outside of the shields, but that's exactly what didn't happen. So at this point, Captain Dagla is losing a fairly strong shield ball just to not having enough means of dealing with glaives. Same time, Kooten coming in with the blast wings, trying to deal some damage to the anti air forces. Could actually work reasonably well. But it's still tricky because there are anti air forces everywhere. The blast wings can't easily get in. The massive blast wings coming in here on the south side did a fine job, but over in the center, they're accomplishing nothing. At the same time, though, Northwest is securing a lot of naked expansions over to the northeast side of the map and the southwest side of the map. I mean, Pudis is just going ham on those expansions. That seems to be the entire game plan, is just build all the expansions in the world, and then everyone else uses the money. Which is a good plan. I mean, that's how you win in 0 games. You get more money, and then you use that money to destroy your opponents. Or build units to destroy your opponents. And considering there's a 20 metal per second lead on the side of Northwest, yeah, it totally makes sense. Good job, Pudis. Downside, however, these are naked expansions. These fencers are just going to be able to waltz right in here, start just going all the way around, and that's going to be it. They're not going to have too much trouble actually dealing with this expansion. Now, granted, these blast wings should be able to get rid of one of the metal extractors. No problems there. But the lotus locusts can't really get in. The bandits will be able to tear, tear apart the fencers. But at the same time, south side, we have Vorox taking out the south side expansion, which is now just not becoming naked. But even then... It's still a tough call. If any real, any real concerted force comes along the south side, it's going to wipe everything out. 
So while Plutus's expansion efforts have been fairly strong and fairly effective, they are being undone. Luckily, though, for the Northwest team, they did manage to at least get a fair amount of metal in the process. I mean, they've been ahead by 10 to 20 metal per second this entire game, so it's not for nothing. This kind of sucks that it didn't manage to hold on to it. At least not completely. Same time, though, we have Kudin Akud going around the back. They should find no real success. Unfortunately for them, the Razors are up now. There was a timing where that could have worked, but that timing is not now. Still, though, Razor's a bit out of, out of range. Get rid of one of the workers. Nicely done. That's one Mason down. I would recommend that Kooten actually retreats with these, banch these locusts, but I, I don't know. Three of them do get out of there. So that at least does manage to get some value without losing too much material in the process. And at the same time, Southside Pudis going for a highly upgraded commander. That lightning... Actually, not the lightning gun. It was the multi-stunner. That's what it is. Multi-stunner making short work of the forces coming in. And, okay, so the south, the southwest side of the map is definitely being well defended. The northeast side of the map is a bit less so. It's a bit more precarious. And it's pretty clear southeast, they're going to turn that into an economic parity, if not an advantage. And at the same time, we do have a revenant coming in here, trying to get rid of the commander, but it's going to take three or four passes before the, com before the commander goes down. By that point, anti-air forces should be available. I mean, they've got the gremlins here, got some crashes going around here as well. I think Northwest realizes, sorry, Southeast realizes that Northwest went for heavy air. I went for a lot of air units, and yeah, it's a good choice. Although at this point, Putus, sorry, Putin has switched over to spiders, or at least added spiders. Not switched, but still throwing spiders in the mix. A curious choice in a map like this. Cliffs do favor spiders to an extent, but the map is so large and spiders generally so slow that I don't quite understand the logic. I mean, unless they're planning on building some transports as well, but I don't see that. It's just going for the revenants instead. So I'm not really sure what Akutin is planning on doing other than slowly marching into their opponent's base. Maybe supporting the shield ball? That would make sense. Actually, rather impressive shield ball at that. Worth noting, there's not a whole lot of ground forces coming in from the Southeast team. They're mostly focused on getting, you know, some riots and so forth, but mostly anti-air. And mostly defenses. Like, a lot of anti-air defenses coming in from the Southeast team. This is a huge boon. Northwest team, if they go in with the shield ball... And yeah, the air, any air forces supporting them are going to have a hard time, but the ground forces will be able to waltz right in. There is nothing that'll stop them. Admit, admittedly, though, Southeast team does have a lot of resources. They could easily build something to stop the Northwest team should the Northwest team attack, which they inevitably will. I mean, that's how this game goes. You don't just stand around doing nothing all day. At least I hope so, because otherwise it gets kind of boring. But yeah, this giant ground force doesn't really have a whole lot to answer to it. It's just a bunch of thugs and a bunch of rogues, and there's... Not much else. I mean, the fencers can do a decent job, but the fencers can only go so far. And otherwise, yeah, it's not much. I mean, if you look at the look at the troop positionings coming in from Kooten, I feel like they're trying to set up a distraction over to the north side. I mean, so much of Covert's forces are on the north side, so much of the blue team's forces overall on the north side, that it's kind of hard for them to actually get back to the base if needs be. Granted, radar should be available, so it shouldn't be a big problem, but no, not really. If you look at the radar coverage, it's actually only halfway down, so it's, no, it's actually very much a possible threat. They have no idea what's being built. That is, North, the Southeast team has no idea that Northwest team is massing this giant force, and they have absolutely no idea when this Northeast team is going to go and use it. Not to mention, Poot is doing a fine job maintaining that South control, so... South is fully secured. North kind of being lost to the Southeast team. So the map will be split basically vertically down the middle. But that's fine. That's absolutely fine. The Southeast team, they've only just now gotten economic parity. If we look at the actual stats, I mean, metal produced, like 7,000 in favor of Northwest. More importantly, metal used, also 7,000 in favor of the Northwest team. And that puts their army value double Southeast's army value. Granted, the Southeast defense value is a little bit higher, but overall... Southeast has got to play catch up here. Northwest has been way ahead in terms of their economy, and they have no issues building up the armies they need. This giant shield ball is testament to that. And not only that, just the defenses being built up in the south, I mean, the south side is pretty well secured. The only tricky part here is making sure that the north side doesn't get completely turned over and Southeast team get the economic advantage as a result. And even more importantly, that this force doesn't get destroyed. However, we're seeing a coup in the spiders actually do have a bit of use here. Use them to get around the expansion over to the north, trying to infiltrate somewhat. Unfortunately, having a bit of a hard time actually getting the damage in. Again, the speed of spiders does hamper them in that regard. 
especially on a map this big. Ooh, and Akutin setting up a wall as well over the south side, so it becomes even harder for Ver for Vorox to get in with the vehicles they have, actually, for anyone on the ground, really. Briley, I think, might be able to get in. No, that's not that's not bot pathable. That is vehicle pathable only, so good job. That solves one problem, as it were, but there's still, of course, the other issue of what to do about the north side, because the north side for the southeast team is pretty secure. They've got it. Now, Revenant's coming along, along the back, trying to clean things up a bit, but but Screamers. Or Artemis, rather. Artemis now. I've never seen actually built in a game. <laughs> Gotta be honest, but still, Artemis coming in here, making sure work with Revenant's not... Bit of a shame there. I mean, that's a lot of money that went into that, because Artemis, yeah, gotta build every single missile that's used. I can't remember the... I don't think there's any cost, though. No, it just takes time. Just takes time, that's all. Really? Nope. Yeah, no cost. Okay, cool. Or at least no displayed cost. The HUD might just be wrong, but I'm fairly certain there's no cost. So yeah, with that, it's just a pretty simple matter of whether, when and where that Northwest team decides to actually march in. They should have enough units to take out the ground force. In fact, the longer they wait, the harder it'll be. I'll admit that Southeast team, they are building much more in the way in the anti-air, which does mean it's harder for them to defend against the giant ground assault. But that giant ground assault is not coming. Like, I don't know what Captain Dabglass is waiting for. Are they waiting for the crow? Are they waiting for the crab? It, like, maybe? Both? Neither? I don't know. Maybe they're, I think they're probably waiting for the crow, and then once that's done, they'll move forward and actually start dealing with things. But it's hard to say, because I've never really seen such a giant ground army just hanging around. Like I said, they're clearly waiting for something. It's just a matter of what they're waiting for that it, I wonder. But at any rate, we should be able to get through with the... Well, with something. Come on, Dabglass. Do something. Attack the things. And if you don't, then we just don't get this game done. And ah, speed it up a bit. I mean, this, it's clearly taking a while because mostly this is just all set up rather than anything else. So with that, it's going to be a bit, it's going to be a time-consuming aspect here. Just, I mean, the Southeast team trying to get in what they can. They have enough anti-air to deal with anything the Northwest team tries to pull. But that's not really what the Northwest team is doing. It's just, except for the Crow. The Crow is actually up. For goodness sakes, when are you attacking Captain Dabglass? Are, are you waiting for an invitation? I mean, waiting to see how much army they have, because they don't have enough army. They really don't have the army to deal with this stuff. It's it's going to be entirely a, a matter of when Northwest attacks, Southeast could fall. But, of course, the longer Northwest takes, the more Southeast is going to be building up a ground or anti-ground army. Because they do have an air factory they just got online, and they also have a couple missile silos as well. So that's still going to be tricky. And that crow going down, this is exactly what I said. They can deal with any air force. I do not understand the logic of not building that. I, like I said, I, why... Why? Why did that crow have to die? Okay, there we go. Looks like now we're finally getting some movement on the shield ball. I mean, really, at this point, there's no reason not to. I spent the entire game up just to make sure we get the shield ball here first. Ah. Well, at any rate, that looks like it's going to be a bit of a problem with the south side of the map. And like I said, I really just... I. Don't get this! Move! Like, seriously, you've got more than enough forces to deal with everything that's there. Maybe they're worried about other forces coming in? I mean, now that the Firewalker's been doing its... Wait, that's not the Firewalker? Nah, the Inferno. Now the Inferno's doing its job, taking care of the artillery forces that were put in place. I mean, why not just go for it? Granted, both sides do have Infernos coming in, so... Yes, the Shield Ball does theoretically have problems going forward, but it's like... I really don't know what was being waited for. But at any rate, Captain Daglas is finally going for it. Going for the north side attack. And that should find something. I can't even zoom in. Wow. I literally can't control the camera. Thanks, frame rate. I don't know why that happens. Ah. Darn it. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. I don't know why the camera is so frame dependent. Actually, no, it's engine stuff is so frame dependent. It's not the camera. I can't even set the speed because it, ah, darn it. I literally cannot change speed right now. 
because the frame rate is eating my commands. But whatever, at any rate, south side of the map is basically now a stalemate. The north side of the map, however, is definitely going in favor of the Northwest team. Co Cobra's commander should go down in just a few seconds. Oh, maybe Captain Dabglass is... Oh, okay, the lower rank, kind of new. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I was realizing when Pudis mentioned the army thing, that must be Captain Dabglass is a much newer player, doesn't really understand how the game works. And doesn't understand that that much shield ball is more than enough to attack with. And your opponents are not going to be able to deal with that. But, I don't know if they realize that. I mean, at the very least, they'll probably realize it now that they've been able to wipe out their opponent's entire army. And the south side of the map is holding fine. Pudis is holding fine. And have the Doomsday Machine and everything. So, yeah. They should, be, they should have no problems whatsoever. I mean, assuming that this this Wolverine pair doesn't completely wipe out that Doomsday Machine, or the Fusion Plant, or nearly kill the Commander, as it just did. So yeah, that opens the up, things up on the south side, but the north side, ah, oh, Captain Dabglass, just attack already. Oh, I feel so bad for their team. Like, they can attack, they can do so much damage. Captain Dabglass could win the game right now. But they're not pushing it. Now, okay, maybe not quite win the game, because, yes, there's a lot of money that could be shifted over to ground forces if that attack happened. But still, there is a window of opportunity to come in there, and there's a lot of forces being built. But it's not. Nothing's happening with it. It's going nowhere. No, Captain Dabglass, you could have it. You totally have it. But now the Wolverine's coming in. I think, I think it might be too late. Like, ten minutes ago, yeah, definitely. Now, it's like... I mean, if you're not going to use it, give it to one of your teammates. Okay, well... <laughs> Northwest team wanted to resign Pudis. I mean, they lost their commander. Lost their entire south side. That is a blow. But, I mean, it's worth noting that army value... Ah, oh, darn it, no. Alt F1. Army value was... That's not too far different. Although now Northwest... Now they're still ahead economically, so yeah, over... For crying out loud, why... Is this engine so bloody frame dependent? Ugh, whatever. Like, I literally cannot command things or use keyboard controls. They, get, they don't get buffered. I never noticed that before. I don't know. I shouldn't be complaining about the engine right now. But I kind of set up my piece about everything here. Pudis, however, out of the game is 2v3. Northwest team, they're kind of in a tight spot right now just because they haven't been able to push. Like, they have this giant ground force that is idle. Like I said, it's just... I don't know why, but Captain Tabulous refuses to use it. Like I said, I don't know if they're afraid of losing it or what, but at this point, the fact that they haven't used it meant that this Northwest team went from having a commanding economic and mil military lead this entire game to losing because their army is sitting at home. I mean, there's not much they can do about that now. I mean, the Wolverines coming in here, that's pretty much... That's death. Like, the amount of Wolverines coming in here... There's no easy way of getting through that. So, yeah, with that, with the entire south side of Pudis' entire bulwark being destroyed, not much is going to stop the southeast team from moving in. And that should be game pretty soon. Again, this giant shield mall is going to be more just a nuisance for the northwest, sort of the southeast team to deal with than anything else, because northwest team, they never used it. They had the army. They never made use of it. And now it's going to be torn apart. I mean, the amount of phantoms that are out there, that would cut through the shields reasonably well. But even then, that's a lot of shields that are all overlapping each other. So really, not a whole lot to say on that, because the phantoms... Actually, well, I don't know to say. It's all a matter of em empirical research. Like, we'll see what the phantoms actually manage to do, because I don't think they'll be able to get through the shields quite yet. They will, however, be able to wipe down the shields to nothing quite quickly. But... Yeah, it'll take a few shots before... Take a few volleys overall before the shields start to really break down. But now, moving in. Last desperate attempt from Captain Dabglass to do anything to their opponents. And, like, it should just deal a lot of damage. These are a lot of shields, but... Oh, unfortunately, getting away from the... I mean, mostly dirtbags. They're still getting away from the shield cover. And the shields themselves just breaking apart, not supporting each other much anymore. And the thug's able to support the Aspas is reasonably well, but it's just not going to be enough. So, with that last-ditch attempt from Captain Dabglass, quite frankly, two minutes too late, I can't control anything. Uh. 
Anyway, yeah, with that attack being a little too, little too late, doesn't quite work. I, like I said, I could have seen it working at the 15 minute mark or so. Ugh, for crying out loud. Mm. I could see it working at the 15 minute mark or so, because it looked like the army value around the midpoint of the game. Yeah, that was definitely the point where Northwest had a, had a commanding lead army-wise. They could have easily come in and dealt with it. But not anymore. At this point, that really cannot be said. So, yeah, ultimately, that's... <sighs> ultimately, it's going to be it. Captain Dabglass being the last one around. Akutin just resigning. So, yeah, that should be game. And indeed it is. So, really, the main thing I'd say is, I think part of the request was to know what to do. No, recognize when you have an advantage and attack. That, to me, is the biggest thing. If you know you have an advantage, and you take advantage of that advantage, you'll probably do fine. So that was that. I've got at least one more match tonight, though. It's going to be from the tournament last or two weeks ago. FFC versus RAR. People were requesting it on YouTube, and I thought, you know what? Okay, fine, fine. I'll do it. I'll do it. It's fine. Because... Basically, it's... It's a game. It's probably a good game. And the way that the tournament was structured, I could have theoretically done it, but I didn't, like, specifically ask, hey, could you have the tournament run a little bit longer so I can do both? I don't generally want to re recap tournament matches, but I figure in this case I'll, I'll slide. May, may, ugh, I'll let it slide. So, go with that, and we'll have that in a second. It's also on Gecko Isle. So yeah, it's going to be FFC versus Raw on Gecko Isle from the semifinals of the previous tournament. So stay tuned for that. It'll be up in a couple of minutes.